Galatians chapter 6, if you would, please, pretty please, with sugar on top. There is a, um, and some of you probably already know this, I probably, I, I got probably a dozen uh, texts and emails and messages from people. There's a new video floating around. Dee, have you seen it? Shadowgate. Have you seen it? Got to see it. Got to see it. Um, usually stuff like that, I don't, you know, people send it to me. I watch it because I get into it and I want to learn what's going on. And, and uh, I don't usually recommend it to my wife. She's got different interests than me. But I recommended it to her because all this, all this riots and stuff that's going on, it'll make sense. Why are they wanting to defund the police? You, you take away something to, to make a void so you can fill it, okay, with something else. That's always the plan. Always, always, always the plan. But you can't just get people to just one day wake up and say, we hate the police for no reason at all, okay? You have to fill their minds with it. Now, who remembers a guy by the name of George Floyd? Okay. So are they still protesting George Floyd? They quit doing that a month ago. So it's not about George Floyd anymore. What is it about? Replacing police, replacing laws. Remember the Antichrist in Daniel 6, the Bible tells us that he shall seek to change times and laws. Okay? So you can always tell. John said the Antichrist is not here yet, but the spirit of Antichrist is. And it's already working, and it's been working for years now. And Antichrist always seeks a change in everything. So if you like... America, if you like our Constitution, if you love our flag. By the way, we got our new American flag out there. It was bigger. And the Christian flag is out there now, along with the police flag. And we're proudly flying all three. Amen? I don't want to defund police. I want more. And what was it I'd heard? Um, oh, the governor of Missouri, he's got a crime bill that they're working on, and he's adding to it now to give the Missouri Attorney General the ability to start dealing with the cases in St. Louis that Kim Gardner won't do, like murders. There are murder prosecutions that she won't even touch. She won't touch them because certain police were involved. So she's not even gonna try the cases. So she's letting 52 murders in the city of St. Louis in the month of July alone. That's almost two every night and not one of them has been prosecuted. So the Missouri Attorney General now is gonna start stepping in. Of course, she don't want that. She don't want that to happen. And you have to ask yourself, is she crazy? No. No, she's crazy as a fox, like a fox. There is something else that she wants done or the people who own her are using her to put something else in its place. And I guarantee you one thing. Number one, it's going to be a big politician skim the money off the top type deal. That's the first thing that's going to happen. Okay? Because all these programs, that's what they're about. They're about funneling money to political candidates, cronies, giving contracts to them and getting money. I hear I've got to talk about the Sunday school lesson, but that's. But if you watch the video Shadowgate, it's about an hour and a half, something like that. It's worth the watch. Now, some of it may fly over your head because it's kind of technical, but it deals with the fact of who is who is really gathering all of the data that your phone, your television, your tablet, your computer, your watch whatever, your pacemaker, whatever. Who's really gathering that data and what are they doing with it? What are they doing with it? Okay? And there's something in there that I've been saying for a couple of years. I'm not worried about a guy in a cubicle 
looking at my emails, looking at the text messages I send to my wife, because there's not enough people in the world to do that. You'd have to have 7 billion people to monitor 7 billion people, okay? I'm more worried about artificial intelligence because it's developing to the point to where artificial intelligence is starting to become more like us. And when it becomes more like us, it's not going to be satisfied. It's going to become more like God. But it's going to be a God made in the image of corruptible man. That's Romans chapter 1. So that's happening right this minute. Happening. Artificial intelligence analyzing all of your data, everything. And I mean everything. And artificial intelligence knows more about you than you know about yourself. Because it has it stored somewhere. Everything. So get ready, folks. The world's changing right in front of us. Slowly, so we can't see it, but it's changing. Galatians 6 now. Verse 10. I usually don't recommend somebody else's videos. Not, it's not arrogance, it's just that I just don't trust a lot of things. Uh, but this one was well-researched and um, actually links to the sources and the source material. You can find it anywhere. So, um, all right, Galatians 6, verse 10. Let's pick it up there. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12 when he told everybody that he had a thorn in his flesh. I know about those thorns. I have a few of my own. You have yours. You have yours. You have yours. Everybody's got a place where the devil or a messenger of Satan will come against you nearly every day. And you want that. You want that. If you don't have the devil bothering you, it's because he doesn't see you as a threat. He does not see you. You know those lion videos we watch in my office, Sterling? We're, those lions. Lions eating like a zebra or something like that. We watch those in my office. Well, those lions are, the guy filming that is a park ranger, and he's got a, he's got a big vehicle full of about 10, 15 passengers. They're all with their cameras, okay? And they're probably within 30 yards of that lion. And pe I hear people asking the guy, aren't they afraid of us? No, mm -mm, they're used to it. And when you get a, a zoom out, you see that there's probably a half a dozen or as many as, many as 20 different vehicles full of people watching this lion eat this zebra okay well the lion knows something and the, the park rangers are pretty strict about it nobody gets out of that vehicle nobody does if you do they'll take you back and kick you out it's a no no big no no they'll find you for it too nobody gets out of the vehicle and he says the lions don't see us as a threat as long as we're not getting out and they'll think that we're either going to attack them or try to steal their food, which they're not going to allow. So as long as we stay in the vehicles, we're fine. And those lions are so used to those trucks pulling up every day that they give it a look, and then they go back to eating or napping. It's funny to see a lion with a big swelled up belly laying like this. Okay? Looks like us. But that's my point. When those lions don't see you as a threat... Who's the lion, the roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour? And when he doesn't see you as a threat, there's something wrong with you. You should be a threat to the lion, okay? You should be. So if you've got a messenger of Satan buffeting you daily, that's a sign which is your thorn in the flesh, that's a sign that God is with you, God favors you, Christ is in you, and the reason why is that devil, I mean, does the queen send out army hornets to go attack something that is a threat to the hive? Yep. Send them out. Here it comes. Here comes a threat. Anybody that is a threat to the hive those bees will let you know you're too close. You may not even know where the hive is. The bees will tell you. 
oh, what's going on here? Okay? So that's the thing. If you've got a thorn, tell God thank you. Got it? That is the presence of Christ in you. And anytime, he showed us this in the four Gospels. Anytime Christ showed up to a person who had devils, how did the devils react? They were scared to death of Jesus. They knew exactly who he was, and they knew what he could do to them. They knew his power, and they knew that they had to obey him. And they did every time. So if Christ is in you, and devils know it, they are going to attack you. Boom, boom, boom. It's going to get you. So Paul said, when he heard God say, my grace is sufficient, for in your weakness am I made strong, Paul said, I'll choose that one. I'd take that over being strong myself any day. Because Paul knew what that did to him. It made him full of pride. So that's, that's what I see here in this verse. Um, Galatians 6, 10 again. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Am I in fear? Why didn't somebody tell me? I was wondering why my, what was on my pet tablet didn't match what I was reading. Galatians, fell. that's a good lesson though, amen? All right, now we'll get to the real lesson. As we, Galatians 6.10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. Thank you, Gary. See, this is how, what my wife has to do all the time. Uh, Mike, mm -mm. what? Okay. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Now, do good. This is part of the two commandments that we have. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. So number one in this is that we treat people outside of our church. We treat them right all the time. You treat the people at the bank right, even though that's aggravating. You treat people who are helping you at Walmart right, even though they ring stuff up wrong. You treat the waitress right who serves you your meal, even though you don't think you got the best, if you don't think you got the best service, don't tip her very much. I said very much. I always give a little, even if I don't like the service, I always give a little. If I like the service, I give a lot. I do, way more than 10%. That's treating people right, okay? But then he said, especially them who are of the household of faith, who does that mean? Brothers and sisters, don't ever attack a brother or sister, ever. If I know somebody is a King James believer or says they are a King James believer, I don't attack them publicly. You never hear me call out somebody for what I disagree on their doctrine. I may call out their doctrine and why I disagree with it. But as far as naming somebody to hurt them or to try to damage them in some way or to try to get at them in some way or whatever, just go on and attack. If I know they believe the Bible, hands off as far as naming names is concerned because they're brethren, supposed to be brethren. And if they're not, God knows the difference. God will take care of it. But I get attacked a lot from people who are King James believers. And they've made videos on me, chewed me up, spit me out, and said all kinds of things about me. And I've learned over the years not to retaliate. That was my, early on, that was what I wanted to do. And I did in some cases. But God has kind of pulled me back a little bit. If I know that they believe this Bible, now, guys like Benny Hinn, Ken Copeland, the Pope, people like that, hand, it's, there's, I just go after them. Name names, I don't care. Because I don't believe they're of the same... They, we, we don't have the same God as Kenneth Copeland. I guarantee you. Do not have the same God and same Savior as Kenneth Copeland in the same gospel. So anyway, treat people right. Verse 11. Now you see, we get a glimpse of what possibly Paul's thorn might have been. He says, you see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. Paul used, and we know this, because Paul would sign some of the letters that way. We know that Paul used like a secretary. 
The, the word back then was amanuensis. That was somebody who wrote, somebody who could write and read, and that was hired to write letters. Because back 2,000 years ago, not everybody went to school. Most people didn't. So if, if you couldn't read or write, and you wanted a letter sent, you had to hire somebody. It's like a telegraph. If you wanted to send a telegraph back 100 years ago, who knows Morse code? Not me. So you had to pay somebody to send a telegraph. They'd tap it out. Okay, so there was these people back then that wrote letters. People could talk. So you tell me what you want and I'll write it down. So Paul used somebody like that because he couldn't see very well. But toward the end of the letters, Paul would take the pen and write some things out himself in letters that he could see. No, he didn't have glasses. They didn't have that. So he would write them big enough to where he could tell what they were. And he says these words, you see how uh, large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. What that was, was Paul's way of authorizing and signing the letter to let those people know this really is Paul. Because, uh, go to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. Look at verse 2, chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. Paul said that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us. Look at what he's saying here. Paul was aware that there were some guys living in that day that were writing fake gospels. The gospel of Thomas... The Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of James, and the Gospel of Judas Iscariot, believe it or not, are all Gospels, so-called, that were allegedly written by Peter or Thomas or James or Mary Magdalene or Judas Iscariot, but they weren't really written by those people. They were written by a cult called the Gnostics. And the Gnostics were part of this mystery religion, this mystery doctrine, this secret, sort of like a secret society. And they had these ideas about God that were totally off. Rick, actually, their God was the Antichrist. Their God was the devil, and the Antichrist was their savior, and that's what they were did. They wrote l these gospels to make it look like Jesus said these things and did these things and Jesus neither said them nor did them. And those were floating around. Paul knew it. He said, we are not, as, we are not, um, how did he go? Something like, we are not as those who corrupt the word of God. He already knew the corruption of God's word was in effect and people were writing false letters. So he says here, 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, or nor, near, nor by letter as from us. And he says back here in Galatians, you see how with large letter I've written in you with mine own hand. That was now Paul signifying, this is really Paul. This is really my letter. This is my commandments to you. And you have to understand, Paul has authority. Even though that church has a bishop, Paul's authority supersedes that. As an apostle, it's just like us now. I'm an authority in this church. But who's in authority over me? The Apostle Paul. He and Peter and John. The office of apostle was given to these men by Jesus Christ himself personally. And they were authorized by God to write out the doctrines that you and I have now. Those are in authority over me and over every one of us. So Paul signs his own letter with his own hand. He's probably holding a pen like this, writing big letters. Okay? Um, verse 12, now, and after he says this, he says, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law. Underline that in your Bible. That is exactly what James said at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. 
if I remember right, it was James who stood up and he said, why are we constraining the Gentiles to keep the law when we ourselves, we're the Jews, we didn't keep the law. That's the dirty little secret of Jews. We pretend we keep the law, but you and I both know we're Jews, we don't keep the law. How many times have we been, how many times have we broken the law? We've been breaking the law all of our life, even though we're all circumcised, yep, we're Jews, we're the seed of Abraham, we can do no wrong, and yet we do wrong. So it was James that convinced him, and Paul, that's what he's saying here. Because he says, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law. Nails them. Tells the dirty little secret. But then he said, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Look what he did. He's one of us now. He's become one of us. And they glory in that. We made a proselyte unto him. And what did Jesus say in Matthew 23? They'll compass land and sea to make one proselyte. And when they've done, they've made them twofold more the child of hell than they were before. You know what twofold the child of hell is? Second death. Paul, uh, I think it was Peter said they were twice dead. The false prophets are twice dead. That means that God has already turned them over to a reprobate mind. And there is no coming back from that. Do I believe that? You better believe I do. I believe there are people out here right now in churches all around the world who are already twice dead. God has turned them over to a reprobate mind. They mingle sin with salvation. They preach false doctrine. And were, to, were you to approach them to try to correct them in a spirit of love and coming together, they would eat you up. And they are never, ever going to be changed. Ever. And there are people like that on this earth right now. If you don't believe that, just go through the internet. Go through the whole internet. Find out what people are saying. I guarantee you they never change. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, because this was brought into our church several years ago. Finnis Dake and his doctrines. He is sort of the grandfather of the whole charismatic movement. And he said that God had downloaded the entire Bible into his brain one night and he could quote the whole thing if he, if he wanted to. He could sit and quote the whole thing. That's what he said. That's what he told everybody. And he supposedly has insight that God has never given to anybody else in the whole world. And Finnis Dake believed and he wrote it out. And he said this, if you are sick, you're not saved. And it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. If you get sick, you, are, you have lost your salvation because you have chosen to let Satan enter your life. All sickness, he said, is because of Satan. And he said, you have chosen to allow Satan to come into your life and make you sick. Therefore, you've lost your salvation. Now, you can get it back by, with, through faith, getting rid of that disease. And he actually believed that any Christian who dies should die the way Moses did. Moses was not sick, didn't have the sniffles, didn't have leukemia, didn't have cancer... He didn't, have, he didn't have palsy. He had no sickness in him whatsoever. God just ended his life on this earth. He had his full life force, the Bible says, in him. Okay? So, Finnis Dake said, any Christian who dies that way, you're assured that they're saved. But any Christian who dies any other way, they've lost their salvation and they're in hell right now. He, he equated healing with salvation. Now... Here's the funny part. I went, I wonder if he's dead now. And I found out he was. And then I said, I wonder what he died of. Parkinson's disease. You know anybody with Parkinson's disease, George? How long does it take once they find out they have Parkinson's disease, how long does it take to kill them? Years. It's not like they got shot. It isn't like they were in an automobile accident and died immediately or lived a few minutes after that. Once you find out you have Parkinson's disease, it takes years, and it is a horrible, excruciating... My, our pastor here, Ken Goff, who married Lisa and I, who was here when I surrendered to call to preach, he died of Parkinson's disease. And I talked to his wife at his funeral. She said the last six months were terrible. So we just had him doped up with morphine out of his mind just because of the pain. Now, you stop and think about that. Here's the man who's told everybody in the world, if you have a disease and you die that way, just, and because you didn't have enough faith to get rid of it, you're, you're lost, you're going to hell. 
And he had years. He had years to supposedly rid himself of Parkinson's disease, and it never left him. Okay? Twice dead. He was twice dead. He had died years ago. Okay? All right. Um, I was going to teach on persecution this morning because the main part of this is in verse 12, lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. But let me keep reading this and, and we'll get to that next Sunday. Paul says this in verse 14. And this is a wonderful verse. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. I had to memorize that verse when I was in seventh grade. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in... Oh, that ain't it. God forbid that I should glory. I don't know where my mind is today. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. You are already dead to this world. How did Pat Boone sing it? He had a song called Everybody Dies, and I love that song. Because he said, he sang it in the song... Just born once, die twice. Born twice, just die once. Think about it. If you're just born once, you'll die twice. You'll, you'll have this death and then an everlasting death in the lake of fire. But if you're born twice, you only die once. And if you're born twice... Remember when you got baptized? Remember what that was about? It was about you saying to the world, this world is already dead to me. It's already dead to me. Now, I'd like to give you a rosy forecast and tell you that I think everything's going to get better if Trump wins the next election. Okay? At some point, all of us are going to be up against a God, a God called Antichrist. And when you read Revelation 13, it specifically says he made war with the saints and prevailed. And it also says in Revelation 13, who is likened to the beast? Who's able to make war with him? So we've created this monster called artificial intelligence that we taught it how to play checkers and it learned how to beat us at checkers. We then taught it how to play chess and it beat us. At, it has beaten the best chess expert, human chess expert in the world, Gary Kasparov. Beat him handed him his whole backside to him, beat him bad. Then they taught it how to play Go, which is a Japanese game that the movements of it d don't make sense. There's no logic to it, and that's how you win. It's sort of like trickery. And the AI beat the best Go player in the world. And the, that guy, I, I watched a little documentary about him, and he said, they've asked me to repeat this. He said, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I already know I'm going to lose, and I'm not going to sit there for another five hours while this thing just murders me on this go board. And it's a very complicated game. It takes hours and hours and hours to play this. And they, a computer figured out how to beat him. Okay? Um, so what's next? They figured out how to play checkers. They figured out how to win at chess. Figured out how to win at Go. And then they developed an AI. And I don't understand some of these new video games and the, and the keyboard layout. But there's a guy who's really good at playing some of these games where you're getting attacked by zombies all around you. And you, get, you have to shoot thousands of them as they're constantly coming in on you. Okay, and this one guy, I mean, he, boy, he can do that. He can do that with the keyboard. Me, I'm still back with an Atari joystick going. Playing Pac-Man, okay? 
and they, uh, they developed an AI system that could beat this guy, the world champion at playing this game, a system that could beat this guy. So practically any war battle type scenario game that can be played, AI can beat every human in the world at it. So when this artificial intelligence system does take over, and it will, will we be able to even unplug it? Mm -mm. I've already seen those movies. Remember the movie War Games back in the 80s? Remember that? You ever see that movie, War Games? Oh, come on. And it was about a kid who was trying to beat this computer that was hooked in to the missile defense system in the United States and this computer was going to start World War III launching missiles at Russia. And it was going to win. He couldn't figure out how to stop it. That's what's coming. Okay? Where, where was I? Why did I say that? Anyway, I've already, I've already found out that this world is not going to get better until Christ comes down here. So between this point and that, I am crucified uh, with Christ, God forbid that I should glory, saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me. Let this world go. Let it go. Let the money, let the dreams. Now don't give up. We're going to keep plugging along. Am I going to defend my church against all doctrinal issues? Absolutely. Are we going to defend this church if somebody comes in here meaning harm? Absolutely. Am I going to defend my family, my home, my property, my wife? Am I going to defend her? Absolutely. If called upon to defend my nation, do you think I would hesitate? Not for a second. Not for a second. Okay? I believe that standing is victory in itself. And that's what the Bible says. Having done all, stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Having done all to, with, to withstand in the evil day. When you stand, you've already won. Even if they cut your head off, you've already won. And the devil never understands that. But it's about letting this world go. Because it's on a course right now. The prince of the power of the air has this world on a course. That's Ephesians 2.2. 2. And God took us out of that years ago, didn't he? Um, verse 15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. I've covered so many topics this morning, I have no idea what to call the Sunday school lesson when we post it online. I might tell Lindsay, just put question marks, like five question marks for the title of this one. Let people figure it out. A new creature. Circumcision, physical circumcision, does not gain you salvation. Earthly rituals do not gain you salvation. If God created us in this body, can we alter this body to make it acceptable to God? No, God's already rejected this. It's already written out. He's rejected it. It must be a new creature. And who's the only one who can create the creature? The creator. God. Only God can do that. Only God can change somebody. Only God can fix somebody's problems. Only God can put a new person in you. When Keith Crum got saved, I will never forget it as long as I live. Because, number one, God worked it out to where I was in his room and nobody came in, his hospital room, and just one, two, three, led him to the Lord. It was the easiest thing I'd ever done leading somebody to the Lord, short of them coming to the altar saying, I want to be saved. He wanted to be saved. And as soon as he got done praying, the doctor came in, told him the bad news. You were eat up with cancer and you're going to die. And three days later, they led him out of the hospital. His boys are taking him over to the drugstore to get his medicine. And he said, guys, I feel like I got somebody living inside of me. -hoo -hoo! I, when they told me that, I said, you boys have been reading the Bible all your life. And it took you years to figure that out. He got it in three days. Three days he figured out he's got a new man living inside of him. 
I can't wait to get to heaven. Shake his hand, tell him, you, you did well, Keith. It was a short race that he ran, but he ran it well. Okay? Because, I mean, he died. God took him. And that's what it is. It's a new creature, and only God can do that. Earthly rituals and circumcision and keeping this law, that's baloney. It doesn't work. Verse 16, and as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them. And mercy upon, look, look at this, mercy upon, every time I read this, I want to say the God of Israel, but that's not what it says. The Israel of God is what it says. And it's the only time in the Bible you're going to find that phrase. The Israel of God. What it means is, we are the Israel. We are Israelites. Not by genetics, not by human genetics, but by the incorruptible seed of the word of God. That's that new man. How is it that a Gentile can become a Jew? Get circumcised? No. You must have the Israel of God living inside of you, and that's Jesus Christ. Verse 17, from henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you think Paul meant by that? I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you think? What do you think he's saying here? That a mark, he had a mark in his right hand and forehead? No. What is he saying? Paul went through his resume. I can't remember what book it was, but he went through his resume of all the shipwrecks he had been, all the beatings he got. Uh, 39 stripes saved the one, what, about five times? All the times he'd been locked up in chains, all the time he had been nearly killed, all the times they were they had been chasing him forever, trying to kill him. Paul gave his resume of how many times he had got beaten up for Jesus. Now God knows me. God knows that when it comes to fighting, I'm the biggest, don't take offense to this, sissy girl in the world. Okay? I am not a fighter. And with these looks, I'm not a lover either, okay? I'm just a nerd. So for Paul to go through all that and still be trucking along for Jesus, that had to be God's power in him, and it would have to be God's power in me because after the first one, I would go, I can't do this. Remember the first time we went to Kenya, Sterling? I was a mess. I was a mess from the moment we got on the plane to go over there. I was a mess. And I said, I'll never come back here again, ever. I am never coming back to Kenya in my life. And now I'm going, would you hurry up with this stupid COVID thing so we can get to Kenya? I can't wait to go back. God did that in me, okay? And that's what he does. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll get marked. By, you'll get scarred by this world attacking you, trying to tear you apart for serving God. Jesus he will he'll come at you with everything but if you're really saved it won't work brethren the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit amen next Sunday morning if I can remember if I can remember this between now and then we'll talk about persecution okay persecution of the saints is a real thing and the fact that it hasn't happened in this country doesn't mean that it won't happen because it's coming, okay? It's coming. Do you think that the evil powers that be know that you go to church and believe your Bible? Do you think they know? I guarantee you they do. I guarantee you they know. I guarantee you that whatever group is manning all of these computers that are monitoring all of everybody's data, I guarantee you they know who is more a faithful member of God's kingdom than I do or you do. And I mean, as far as this church is concerned, I guarantee you they know. By what you do every single day, because normally we do it right here on these and these. Okay? Father, I love you. Thank you for your word. Father, I pray to your God should help me preach this morning, get my mind focused on one thing. Let me be a blessing to these people. Father, fix it to where we can go back to Kenya. I can't wait. I pray to your God that you'd bless them. Help us, dear God, to continue to be a blessing 
to them and <clears throat> people around the world and people right here in town. Lord, just use this for your kingdom. Bless your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen.